gosh, it's been an emotional morning, um, a very interesting day for all of us. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, this is my fourth SMAC conference. I've been lucky enough and privileged enough to speak at all of them. And it's a great conference. I think at its core, it's always been about emergency medicine, critical care, resuscitation, and pre-hospital care increasingly. But one of the things it does very well, and it's always done, is given a platform for big questions, for the long time horizon questions that we've got, for the issues which are bigger than just what we're gonna do next week with the next patient on the next teaching session. And so when I spoke to Chris Nixon about what we were gonna do at this smack, we thought about what are the big questions, what's shaping emergency medicine? Because we're on a journey. I'm on a journey. This is me back in 1992 when I started. It's not that funny. <laughs> That's the best picture that I've got from that era. Crikey. It's not a good start. So this is me back in 1992 in Manchester, which is just across the Irish Sea from here, when I started getting involved in emergency medicine. And back then, it was really exciting. I had some truly inspirational people who I looked up to, so people like Tony Redmond, Kevin McCoy Jones. These might not be big names to you, but they were really influential to me. The patients that we saw, were really exciting. We saw a lot of trauma. The South Manchester Accident Rescue Team, SMART, grew around that time. It was one of the first pre-hospital services in the UK. It was really thrilling. And major trauma is what engaged me. It engages a lot of people on conferences like this, doesn't it? It gets exciting. If I think about now, so I'm about halfway through my career now, I'm 48 years old, then it's very different in my department. We see a lot more elderly people, we see a lot more complexity, we see a lot more polypharmacy and polypathology. And the days when I just used to sort of see a patient with chest pain and just say, off to the medics, are now gone. That's a key part of what we do. A lot has changed in 20 years. And the next 20 years, or the next 30 years of my career, are hopefully going to be just as exciting and just as interesting and just as different. And that's what we decided to talk about today. Where are we going with emergency medicine? What's happening to us and what's shaping us? Now, this is about futurology, and it's always going to be tricky. This is Niels Bohr, famous physicist, one of the most famous quotes about the future that we know. And that's true. I mean, Martians or aliens could come down tomorrow, and we could all be saved of all our diseases, or perhaps they could kill us all. I don't know. Something really radical might happen. But I think there are clues. Does anybody know what this is? Everybody remember the date last year, October the 21st, 2015, is Back to the Future Day? Now, if you think about Back to the Future, it was interesting looking back at that, because going from 1985 to 2015, we had that idea that we could go back and see which technologies had come to fruition and which hadn't. And some had. So things like fingerprint recognition are in Back to the Future too. I'm not sure we've got hoverboards yet. We haven't got flying cars, but many of the things that were predicted back then have come to life. And so when we look to the future, there's always the opportunity to look for clues. And this is where I think we're heading. There are three major factors which are trying to shape emergency medicine, and to some extent, all of your specialties in the next three years, next three years, in the next three decades. So let's have a think about those. The number one, the people. Now, people are going to change. And perhaps the most obvious one is the age of our populations. If you look at the world population, this is the world, it's heavily biased towards young people. And this is a little bit what it was like when I was doing emergency medicine back in 1992. The population of Manchester was younger, and pretty much everybody died about the age of 60 due to incredibly bad health. So we didn't see very many old people. It was a young person's game. But things change. This is known as the demographic transition model, and it shows that emerging societies, when they're very young, have a large number of young people. It looks a little bit like the Eiffel Tower over there on the left, going through the pyramids, then looking a little bit more like the Gherkin skyscraper in London. And then on this right-hand side, you get a contracting population where the birth rate diminishes, and we get more elderly people. And what might not be so obvious on this diagram, of course, is not just the distribution, but the numbers. In the UK, for example, there are an additional 250 people over the age of 85 every day. Now, that's great. I want to be over 85 in a few years' time, and it's a great success of medicine, but major problems for us. If you want to see where we're going, perhaps you want to look at Japan. This is Japan at the moment, so on the dark blue on the left-hand side, and you can see that over the next 20 years, the proportion of people 
over the age of 65 is going to get much higher. And if you're in a population which is shrinking, as many of the Western societies are, that's going to change our demographic massively. Now, I like this. This is a diagram that tells you how people die in the US. It's from Nathan Tao and from the flowing data sites, reproduced permission. He was very kind enough to let us use it here today. And it shows you why we die. And therefore, that reflects the pathology that we see on our emergency departments. And you can see quite clearly that over on the right-hand side, you get lots of circulatory problems, respiratory problems, quite a lot of mental health problems increasing with dementia and cancer peaking a little bit earlier. But the bit I want you to focus on, really, is this bit of external causes here, which is the exciting bit that we do. The trauma, the toxicology, the self-harm. Gets you thrilling. That's what got me going in 1992. But that's not going to be the case in the future. Again, from Nathan, you can track how people change. I just want you to have a look at the gray bar on the bottom right. So as you go through, this is a, a, a population and showing how they're predicted to die as they go on. You can see that external causes really become the dominant cause of death for the first few decades of life. It's only really in your 40s and 50s when it changes. But the gray bar never goes. The gray bar stays right into the late age. And so trauma continues. And in the UK, because of our aging population, now 40% of the patients that we see with major trauma are aged over the age of 70. Our populations are changing, and therefore what we're going to do changes. And it's not just the patients. Our workforce is changing. The average age of a nurse starting training in the UK now is 29. The average age of a nurse themselves is over the age of 40. In some specialties in nursing, it's well over, into, well over the 50 mark. Pension ages are getting longer. Our working lives are getting longer. And our millennial generation, the one that's coming through now, who are going to be our workforce of the future, have a different attitude or a different belief or a different understanding or a different, just a different way of living. They're much more likely to want portfolio careers, to move backwards and forwards, to do different things, to move around. And you might think that's a worry. It's actually a huge opportunity because there's no specialty like ours which would allow people to dip in, dip out, do different things, create subspecialization, if we allow them to do that. If we stick in our current system, which is really rather rigid in places like the UK, we will lose our future workforce. So demographics. Our patients are changing, their pathologies are changing, our workforce is changing. What about politics? We think of politics in two ways, really. There's the big politics. We don't exist in a vacuum. And there's no doubt that we're increasingly getting financially constrained about what we do. In the UK, this is really, really heavily felt. It, but even in places like Australia, where Michelle works, where they've had a really good financing system for their health services, they're now beginning to feel a pinch. And we're starting to develop technologies. When I started off in 1992, there wasn't that much that we did in ED, apart from give two bags of normal saline to all the trauma patients, see if we could kill them. But the, that was cheap. But now we're doing much more complex things. And we're having significant challenges about what we can do. We've heard a lot on the conference like this about things like ECMO and helicopters. But every time you spend that money, that's an opportunity lost from somebody else. And emergency medicine is increasingly being seen as part of the public health system. And we need to spend our dollars wisely so that we get the most for the most number of people. And that's not a conversation that we've been involved in that much before. There's a concept of equity and expectation with our public and with um, society and with politi politicians about how we make sure that we give a good service. And that doesn't necessarily mean just doing what we want to do. It's what we need to do for our populations. There's horizontal equity where everybody gets the same regardless. And there's vertical equity, where some people get much more than others. How are we going to get that balance right? And how are we going to communicate that with our patients and our populations? It's going to be a real challenge. We need people to get involved in this. We need emergency physicians to get involved in that debate. And it's reassuring that we're seeing that. The recent president of the American Medical Association was an emergency physician. Congressmen in the US are emergency physicians. And in the UK, we've got MPs who've worked in emergency medicine. We need to embrace these people and help them understand and help get influence about doing the right thing for the, for the populations we serve. And then at small level, sort of local politics, about our scope of practice. If you think historically, and I think Gareth talked about it this morning, actually, when he talked about the development of pre-hospital and emergency medicine, saying it's a great new specialty and it's taken a lot of effort to get there and it's a, a brave new world. He's right. Emergency medicine was founded as a general specialty, and it's one of the things which really attracted me into it. It was a great thing to do all things to all people. But what happens? You get people who have an interest, who develop extra special skills, who get a little niche for themselves. And that leads to specialization, 
you're different to me, I'm different to you, fragmentation, and ultimately division. And we, perhaps we've seen this already with things like pediatric emergency medicine, but are we are going to see more of this in things like geriatrics, pre-hospital care, and even at a conference like this, the concept of the resuscitationist? Is that going to be a new division within our specialty? And can we retain the generalism which we found, were founded on, which is great for places like rural Alberta and rural Australia, and yet have a drive in our specialty to subspecialize, which is great for metropolitan areas, but not generalizable? How are we going to work together as a community to make sure that we can get a balance between the two? The future, if you look at anything else, orthopedics, general surgery, which of course doesn't exist anymore, general medicine, is that we are going to divide into different sects. I think it's a bad idea, but I think that's the direction of travel. And then the third thing, technology, which is probably what you thought about when we think about the future. It's what we usually think, great new gadgets and do new things, and we will. But technology is interesting. I like to think of technology in three ways, three R's. For most technology, you have what we call revision and refinement. So if you think about the motor car invented a long time ago, but it's still fundamentally a four-wheeled object which carries people and goods. It's changed with antelope brakes, turbochargers, superchargers, airbags, that kind of stuff. And we've made it look prettier. So we've refined and revised. And that actually is the natural tendency for virtually every technology. So the, the smartphone in your pocket is now more portable, it's cheaper, it's more powerful than anything that's come before. And for things like ultrasound, um, and point of care testing, that is just inevitably what's going to happen. Over the next five or ten years, it's going to be easier. In five years' time, I'm sure that virtually all of you will have something like an ultrasound diagnostic app on your phone, and you'll be able to use it. Or you certainly have the ability to do it. And that technology is already here. It'll just get cheaper, easier, and more portable. But what I'm interested in for a talk like this is more significant change. Are there any clues out there about the ways that we're going to practice emergency medicine in a different way to the we do now? I'll try and take you through a couple of those. Let's have a think. Where are the clues? The clues are about who are these guys hiring at the moment. There's an awful lot of work being done by some of the big tech giants about healthcare and how we interface with it as physicians and also as patients. I'll show you why. I'm going to pick up two areas today. I've got lots more on the blog site, and everything I'm talking about today will be going out as a blog on the St. Emily's site in the next couple of days. You can look at the detail. I'm going to talk about two things. The first is decision support, about how we make decisions. Because I've always been a great advocate that emergency physicians are brilliant. We're the best people in the world at making difficult, probabilistic, time-critical, information-like decisions. I really like that. That's what we do well. Do we do it well, or do we do it better than anybody else? We still make mistakes, and we still make errors, and we still work in a world of probability. This model, which we teach our medical students, which we know to be wrong, is that you see a patient with a possible disease, you do a test, it's either positive or negative, tell them whether they've got the disease. We know we smack people, we've done the Bayesian approach to diagnostics, and we know it's a little bit more complex than that. Patients come in with a possibility of disease, a pretest probability, we do a test, they have a post-test probability. Casey Parker talks about this very well in his blog, and he's doing presentations here. But then, this pretest probability, what is that? For me, it's a population estimate. So in my department, I know that people, if you turn up in our department and you've got symptoms which are compatible with cardiac disease, your pretest probability of having ACS is about 15%. Got a normal ECG? It's 10%. That's very much a population base. And that works to some extent. But it's not really what happens, is it? If you speak to people who are very expert, who've got lots of great clinical judgment or gestalt, you know, those mythical things that allow people to make good judgments about patients, every time you ask a question, every time you get an answer, every time you get a test result back, probability changes. So Mr. M Mrs. Miggins, when she comes in, may have a pretest probability of 10%, but with a normal exam, it changes. With a slightly abnormal ECG, it changes. With a very abnormal ECG, it changes. Probability is a very dynamic process. And we've done some work in the UK on this using intelligence system, so we use a belief rules-based system, which shows that as a patient transits through their journey in the emergency department, their probability of the target condition, in this case ACS, we looked at chest pain patients, and other diseases changes. And then with a technical model, with artificial intelligence, and this is the sort of thing that people like Apple, sorry, people like Google and IBM are working at at the moment, it's possible to give accurate or more accurate probabilities of disease back. It's like having the wisdom of all the people in this room 
and ensconced in a computer program which can help you make decisions. Now, when we looked at this, we originally thought that it would be the case that it would be like, you know, put the information in the computer, and the computer says yes, the computer says no. Not. Whenever we've explored this with people, whenever we've given people the probability of them having a target condition or not, it's not the way that we think. We as emergency physicians at the moment work often in an illusion of certainty that this person has definitely got a PE or definitely not got a PE. And yet we know that it's probabilistic. If we're able to give people that probabilistic information back, we need a whole new set of skills about how we interpret it to ourselves, to our colleagues, and to our patients. So this is going to make our lives more complex, potentially, but better. We'll need new skills. So that's the first tech thing that's going to change. This will be happening in the next four or five years. What about the second one? What about personal diagnostics? This is really interesting. This is where Apple is spending an awful lot of money at the moment. And it's very interesting. In my pocket here, I've got an iPhone. See that? Looks like this one up on stage. And on the back, there's a couple of things here. So, what does this mean? So this is $99 from the Apple Store. So Lisa, do you want to come up on stage? I just want to show you what the sort of technology which is already out there um, is there. So this, I just picked this up. So just come on a seat, Lisa. So just take that, and I think we can get a camera in on this now. So we can get that focused. And see the feed. So there you go. So this is $99. It will give you an ECG reading, such as the one on the left, which is good enough to diagnose pretty much any dysrhythmia. And also, I have no shares in this company, or I think, to be honest, they're going to make money. Um, I can record it. I can send it on to anybody I like. I can send a recording like this, and I can even send it to a cardiologist in the States to get it read, should I wish. The point is, thank you very much, guys. The point is that that's the sort of technology that just five years ago, you would have to get a referral from your family practitioner to see a cardiologist to get referred to the monitoring department, to walk around with a halter monitor for a few days to come back to have it re-downloaded, and then sent to the cardiologist to be read, and then made an appointment for you in clinic. And yet, this type of technology is now in the palm of your hand. And we are talking about a time where we've got this. This is Tim Cook talking only a few weeks ago in Amsterdam um, at a tech startup conference about how the body should be the equivalent of the car. In the 1950s or 60s, if your car ran out of oil, you'd know it would explode, which is bad. Now, a little red light comes on and goes, hang on a minute, mate, sort your oil out. Their perception is, why, isn't we doing, why aren't we doing this with the body? And if you think about the technology that's already there, portable monitoring for things like saturation, blood pressure, capillary flow, um, heart rate, as you've just seen, ECG monitoring, all of that's able to be, doing, to be done. Accelerometers in the thing, so you know whether somebody's shaking. So Mrs. Miggins, who had the collapse at 2 o'clock this afternoon, who now feels OK, you're seeing her at 5 o'clock, can come in and say, I collapsed today. This is what my ECG was at the time. This is my saturations, my accelerometer data showed that I was fitting. That's a whole new world of diagnostics. It also means that Mr. McGinn's gets woken up at 6 o'clock in the morning to say, you might be having a cardiac event later. I think you should go to hospital. And how are we going to deal with that kind of technology? Because we're no longer in control of that level of biomonitoring. It's really exciting times. So I think it's going to significantly change what we do. And it changed the paradigm of emergency medicine. When I started in 92, we had the idea with chest pain, for instance, that I would admit you to hospital if I could demonstrate that you had pathology. If you had ECG changes or enzymatic changes, we used to do enzymes back then, I'd admit you. Everybody else went home. Pathology had to be proven. We're now in a phase where we're doing things like high-sensitive troponins or looking for very small PEs, where what we're trying to do is to detect minor disease, which may turn out to be major later. So we're now probabilistic clinicians. But perhaps we're entering a phase where we've got the potential for disease or biomonitoring from people just walking the streets. And that's quite exciting. I think that will significantly change what we do in the emergency department. A little bit like if you've seen the film The Minority Report with the precogs so who could detect crime before it even happened and intervene. Five to 10 years. So coming to the end, what does this mean? 
What does this mean for us, me, you as emergency physicians? I think it means a couple of things, really. I think the big drivers are clearly going to be people, progress, and politics. That is going to be shaping what you and I do day to day in the emergency department in 10 years' time, just as it's so different when I look back at 1992. It means we're going to have to train in a different way. We're going to have to be better clinicians about understanding information, clinical data, technical data, to talk about probabilities in a much more overt way. And we have to get involved in managing the change. Things like the demographics are just coming. Can't ignore it. It's going to change the way that we practice. I know Suzanne's going to be talking about that later. So people, politics, and tech progress, the big three. Now, we started with Niels Bohr, didn't we? We started with him saying that predictions are always tricky, particularly when they're about the future. It's a bit nihilistic, really. I want to leave you with another Nobel Prize winning physicist, uh, Gabor, who invented the hologram. And he's a Hungarian who's very interested in the future, did a lot of work looking into the future. He has a slightly different take, and it's the one message I want you to take away from today, is that it's true. We can't actually predict the future, but if we get involved in it, if we shape it, we can invent it. And the next 20, 30 years of emergency medicine, they're going to be just as exciting, just as thrilling, and just as full of change as the last 20. It's going to be a great journey. Thank you very much for your time. From Twitter, a lot of people are interested in how that EKG app works, so maybe you could uh, put that out there um, in a tweet or um, link it. But a lot of the Twitter questions were um, fairly specific, but really looked at how do we uh, retrain residents, junior doctors, et cetera, with the changing demographics without becoming over-fragmenting. For example, one question was, would geriatric guidelines for ACLS, ATLS, would this be a good thing, looking at the changing demographics, or would that be too fragmenting? Um, I'll answer your question in a slightly different way. I think it's insane that we spend so much time learning how to do cricothyroidotomies and virtually no, pain, no time at all learning how to do care of the elderly and chronic pain. <laughs> so, you need a balance. You need a balance out there. We do need to learn about the, the really sexy stuff, but we need to learn about the stuff which is just routine. It's really important. It's what I see every day. 